Hi everyone. Thank you very much for joining us this month for another crypto journey. Uh, I hope you're wherever you are in the country, you're keeping warm. It's uh, been a crazy few weeks of weather. Uh, now, we are going to be talking about a market update. It's been a pretty uh, crazy few weeks and we have Stephen McCaskill uh, to run us through it. Thank you, Stephen. Over to you. Thank you, Julia. And it has really been a crazy almost two months since the beginning of the new year and i'm looking forward to giving this update presented to you by dasit new zealand's number one trading platform for crypto assets since january bitcoin has been on a tear it's uh, up 48 percent potentially more now uh, since the beginning of january ethereum is up 54 percent 66.29% of Bitcoin holders are currently in profit. So that means uh, two thirds of all Bitcoin holders have purchased Bitcoin below the current prices. And since January, uh, almost, I think it's approaching a million new Bitcoin addresses have been created. So there's been a lot of what people say is bullish momentum since the beginning of the year. And currently we are seeing altcoins move like this, like it is a bull market and uh, not endorsing this token by any means, but we are starting to see a number of tokens going parabolic. And uh, very recently we've, we've seen uh, some strange tokens. I think this one has something to do with the price of eggs uh, going up. But uh, this is, again, not an endorsement. Uh, it's likely that you should not buy this token, but do your own due diligence. And this is just showing the market sentiment that we're seeing among altcoins that uh, no one really knows anything about. And we're starting to get a lot of questions. Is the bull market back? And uh, a lot of people have been asking, is now the time to buy Bitcoin? And so I wanted to kind of give an overview of what's happening in the market and go through a thesis. And the thesis that I have, again, this is uh, an opinion. This is not uh, financial advice and uh, market conditions can always change. But this is what I'm seeing right now. And the thesis is that we're not in a bull market, bull market uh, where we have a continued uh, upward trend in the markets of higher highs and higher lows uh, in, in terms of the price is has returned uh, like we had in 2021 and 2022. Uh, but the thesis is that we're currently in a bear market rally. So we're seeing uh, a short term price adjustments and really not sure how long it will last. It could last another day, could last another week, uh, or could last several months. That is where uh, you don't really know. And this is where it is uh, important to take into consideration when trying to make decisions as to uh, whether you should go all in on the market at the moment. So uh, I'd like to pose some questions and, and go through them to see kind of um, what's 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 happening. And so the first one, and this is something I don't want to dwell on too much and uh, really not happy topic at all, but what are all these things have in common? And, you know, we've uh, the world has gone through tremendous grievance in the last few years. You look at the term lockdown it's actually a prison term and that's something that uh, we've all had to experience in one form of another over the last couple of years and we're starting to see trends of uh, crime in a lot of cities up uh, 200 to 300 percent um, suicide and depression up divorce and poverty up and they're the highest uh, some of these things are the highest they've been in 30 to 50 years. And so when we look at what's happening in the world, it's not uh, positive. There's a lot of negative sentiment. 
And I hate to say it, but I think things are going to get worse before they get better. A lot of people are talking about topics like war and, of course, macro events, which are quite unpredictable. And so right now, if we look at the global sentiment, uh, people are not happy. People are looking at things and they're worried and they're saving and they're preserving and they're not really taking into consideration uh, high risks and taking high risk because of the uncertainty that's happening around the world. And another question I'd like to pose is, will there be new lows or in the legacy markets? And I don't know the answer to that, but that is something to pose. And because over the last few years, we've seen an enormous amount of institutional investment in crypto. Uh, within North America, 90% of all investment in Bitcoin since 2020 has been institutional. And I'm not saying whether legacy markets will be up and down, up or down in the near future, uh, because I don't know. But it is something to consider, because if you think that the uh, legacy markets have a further correction, then it is highly likely that Bitcoin and crypto will also have a correction. And if we have a capitulation in the legacy markets like we did during the pandemic in March 2020, then it is very likely that will happen in crypto as well. A lot of people are looking and breathing every word that comes out of the Federal Reserve and looking at things like inflation and looking at all kinds of different data. And it's, it's really the market is being driven by uh, these knee jerk reactions to the news without really taking in, to, uh, taking in the bigger picture. And of course, everyone's looking at things like inflation. People are concerned about mortgage rates increasing with rising interest rates. And if you think about it, with people of, at least in the US, people have locked in interest rates at 3% or less for homes. Those homes will likely never enter the market again because those rates were locked in. Uh, if you want to buy a new home, you're going to have to buy half the house for twice the interest rates um, because you're going to be paying the same amount. And so really the big factor that I think is important or to look at is the job market and what's happening in the job market today and, and over the next uh, year, a couple of years. And we are starting to see in a, a number of sectors, particularly in the tech sector, a uh, large number of layoffs. So that's something that will impact things like uh, other markets, I, I think, to, to a larger degree. And, and by other markets, I mean things like uh, retail credit markets, uh, le home lending, car lending, and the like. So it's, it's really important, I, I think, to keep an eye on the job market and think, um, trying to understand our uh, with so much uncertainty, uh, will the job markets improve or will they get worse? And it's a little bit up in the air, but it's very likely that we will see uh, job markets get worse over the next uh, year, two years. So moving on to crypto, is Bitcoin ready for 1 billion new users? And I pose this question because we're really not going to see the market grow substantially to the size of something like the gold market or other uh, traditional markets until we have the ability to have adoption. And that, that kind of goes, uh, you know, it's, it's almost like the chicken and egg. Uh, Google didn't get to the size it was until it managed to acquire hundreds of millions of users. Same thing with Facebook. And that requires a long time and a lot of effort and work. And so when we look at the overall crypto industry, we see that 
there's still a lot that needs to be done for scalability to get uh, 1 billion new users into the market. And there are technical problems that are still being solved, but there are, is a lot of light along the way. And for Bitcoin, particularly, we're starting to see the Lightning, Lightning Network grow. And what's important about the Lightning Network is that it promises what Bitcoin was meant to promise or used to be back in 2013. You could spend Bitcoin in 2013 and not pay any transaction fees. Now, if you spend Bitcoin, it's anywhere from 20 cents to a couple of dollars, depending on network activity and what you're doing with your Bitcoin, which is pretty high if you want to spend $5 in coffee. And it's even higher if you are in a cash-based economy like uh, uh, the Philippines, for example. And so when we look at the Lightning Network, we see that it's growing, but it's really not where we want it to be for mass adoption. As uh, this data shows, about 2,800 Bitcoin is locked in the Lightning Network. So that's how much liquidity is slushing around for people to use as money to transfer Bitcoin from person A to person B. Now, if you're not aware, El Salvador has bit, uh, adopted Bitcoin as legal tender. And within El Salvador, people have adopted a specific crypto wallet that is Lightning Network enabled. And this enables users to send Bitcoin at fractions of a cent. And it's worked really well. But El Salvador has six and a half million people. So with the Lightning Network having $250 million in liquidity, that works for two and a half uh, or six and a half million people. It doesn't necessarily work for 1 billion people. And so we can see here that adoption is growing and liquidity is growing, uh, although it has uh, initially dropped uh, from uh, all of last year, but it's slowly starting to pick up. And we're starting to see uh, a lot more talk of the use of Lightning Network for payments in different countries. In fact, a merchant provider here in New Zealand is using Lightning Network for Bitcoin payments to pay for things like groceries. And so it's slowly getting there, but again, there's a lot more work that needs to be done. Fear and Greed Index. So we're starting to see the Fear and Greed Index pick up uh, currently at 59. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, it was in the 60s. And if we look at this chart, you can see it at the bottom. What you'll see is the Fear and Greed Index is actually the highest it's been since November of 2021. That was uh, the height of the uh, Bitcoin price. So that was really when the, uh, the market was at its frothiest. And so we're starting to see a lot more of that pick up now. And this is kind of where people are feeling that uh, FOMO, if you will, fear of missing out. And a lot of people are starting to ask, oh, did I miss the bottom? Did I miss the market? Do I need to get in? And we're starting to see a lot of activity, a lot of people uh, jumping in, which really leads to uh, a, 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 an idea that Bitcoin really uh, creates the most pain. And a lot of these people who have entered the market have yet to feel that pain. And so this is where I believe that we are starting to get a lot of entrants into the market that think that the market is up only. Something else to consider, and uh, I, I do have to use an industry technical term, and that is shitcoins. So those are digital tokens that have amassed a lot of value, but they don't really do anything. They don't serve a purpose. And when we look at the wave since 2013, when the first altcoins were uh, uh, released, we see that 
95% of the altcoins from 2013 aren't used or talked about today. There are a couple of successful ones that are still around, like Dogecoin, XRP, Litecoin, uh, of course, Bitcoin. But most of them, uh, Feathercoin, Peercoin, Primecoin, a lot of these ones from 2013, probably never heard of, and uh, Namecoin, Factum, a lot out there that will likely never recover. We saw the same thing in 2017, where 95% of the tokens that were created in 2017 never came back to their former glory. And they've just had a long downward death spiral since. Well, we're kind of at a point where there's still a lot of tokens that were created in 2020 uh, or 2021, 2022, they're still floating around. There's still a lot of liquidity in these altcoins and they really haven't had their, um, uh, been sent to the graveyard yet. And so that's something that uh, is for me a concern that we haven't really seen the end of the bear market because there are a lot of altcoins out there that really have no value and they're uh, still thriving. However, we are starting to see Bitcoin dominance increase. And this is a really important indicator for me because this uh, signals that people are returning back to the basics. So, and with Bitcoin's dominance increasing with this recent price move, this is where I also believe that we will likely have a retest of the lows and potentially a capitulation event in the near future where that Bitcoin dominance continues to increase and the altcoins that really have no use or no value will be sent to the graveyard. So I think that's what we're kind of preparing for right now, where there's opportunity for market makers to have exit liquidity. This is something also I find very interesting. This is the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. And what you'll see is that they have to publicly provide the data. And this data is, to me, very valuable because it shows what institutions are doing. And what, what we'll see is dealer intermediaries. So those are crypto exchanges. Those are trading platforms like Dasset, uh, Coinbase, uh, Gemini, uh, um, a lot of the big uh, wholesale desks. And as you can see, they're actually increasing their short positions and they've been doing so for the last uh, month or so. And uh, they're at a, at a rate of, for every one long position, there are nine short positions more. Whereas asset managers are an interesting lot because asset managers have, over the last few years, really bought at the wrong times. And uh, what I say right now, what I mean by that right now is um, they're currently out of position. Most of the most asset managers went long in October, November of 2021, and so they they bought at the top. And I think. A big reason why is the people that they've hired uh, for their research really have uh, traditional uh, finance backgrounds and have had experience retail and crypto, but they don't really understand crypto uh, to a degree to people that have been in crypto for a long time. And this is why when you look at asset managers and institutional, historically, they've bet at the wrong times. And so uh, again, this is just one piece of data, but the data shows that uh, currently crypto exchanges have increased their short positions and have been increasing their short positions recently, while asset managers, which are institutional have, uh, which have historically invested at the wrong times, are increasing the long positions. So that's something to keep an eye on. And this data is uh, comes out weekly. So great um, 
piece of data to, to keep an eye on. And usually when and, and, uh, crypto exchanges usually get all the data from their customers, they can uh, they have a, a much greater visibility in terms of what's happening in the market. Because of that, they're able to uh, bet one way or the other. And so based on their uh, their transparency or what they can see in terms of that data. And they definitely uh, put in orders. And uh, so that's currently what we're seeing them doing. So when is the next bull market? Well, I can't really say it's going to be uh, tomorrow or next year or the year after. And really, if anyone tells you that they know, they are they have really uh, are, are giving you false hopes or false information. But I would say that we need the Bitcoin price to increase uh, or stay above at least forty five to forty eight thousand US dollars before we start getting really excited about being back in a bull market. And I don't know if that's going to happen this year, could, but uh, I wouldn't put my money on it personally. And uh, we also need to see useless altcoins. Uh, they still need to go to the graveyard and scalability and adoption needs work. And usually what we need is a period of accumulation. And this is where things get boring. You know, things have been really exciting over the last couple of months. Uh, activities picked up, but we really need crypto to be forgotten about. And this is usually the boring periods where there's a long period of time that enable people to put their heads down and work and create value and innovate and invent and meet needs of customers for the next cycle. And that period is partially happening. It's been happening in the last year and happening, uh, I think, over the next year, year and a half. So what can we look at when we look at uh, the market? What, what kind of signals have we seen in the past? And what I'd like to propose as a key point in time, and that is the having or having. And what that means is the point in time where the number of new Bitcoins minted is uh, drops by 50%. And that happens every four years. So the last halving was in 2020. The next one is in April 2024. Now, again, this can't really be a prediction, but historically, a bull market has started about six months after each previous halving. And so that is a key point in time to look at for uh, things that may happen in the market. I'm not saying that that is when a bull market will start, but the likelihood may be higher. And when we look at Bitcoin, it's never been an environment with rising interest rates. And so there's a lot happening now that Bitcoin hasn't experienced. And these unknowns, these uncertainties really create that, just that uncertainty. And so really the idea is uh, looking at the market, it's a great opportunity to start looking at projects and ideas and start building a plan for the next year and a half, where if you're trying to rush into it, uh, then you may need to stop and check yourself. And uh, really the best thing to do is have a plan and look at it long-term. Uh, the market's gonna be here tomorrow, it's gonna be here uh, in 10 years. And so um, if you're rushing, then you might be rushing into a trap. Uh, that's all I have to say there. And so uh, six months after the halving would put us about September, October 2024. And there are potential signs that by then we'll be in a pretty good position for scalability uh, 
the next wave of adoption and uh, implementing things like metaverse tools and all kinds of exciting new products that people can utilize. So what's the current meta that what's everyone looking at today? Where, where are the tokens that are going up uh, thousands of percent in a day? And those are tokens that are promoting artificial intelligence or AI. And uh, this is all the rage. I don't think this is unexpected or really crazy because uh, people are talking about it in the legacy markets. And it's likely that uh, a lot of these tokens are now uh, overhyped over the last few weeks, in the last couple months. And this, this meta is over and uh, people are looking for the next big thing. But uh, at least over the last few months, this is what people have been really diving into. So uh, what's in store for the next year? And this is for the industry as a whole, but also things that DASIT is looking at. And uh, it's really important for that usability and infrastructure. That is a necessity for mass adoption. And that comes down to new wallets, new ways to spend and to use crypto and things are getting easier it's getting better and that's what we want to see and although there's a long way to go it's we're starting to see wallets that are user friendly and that people can adopt and, and not lose their crypto and not have to worry about losing their crypto and they're safe and secure so it's really exciting exciting times when we're looking at the new technology that's coming out and how people are using it. It's just making life easier for everyone. Uh, something that I didn't put in here, but uh, DeFi, decentralized exchanges, they're having uh, quite a bit of comeback and uh, we're starting to see a lot more trust in those because people are uh, learning about taking custody and, and using the crypto themselves on these platforms. Still uh, not the most user-friendly, but it's getting there. It's getting a lot better. Uh, NFTs, uh, we're starting to see more and more use cases. You know, I've, I've, I think I've made the argument uh, last year that NFTs aren't going anywhere. 99% of them are going to die, but the ideas and the use cases are growing and improving. And Entities like Dasset are working on making our website Web3 compatible so that you can connect your crypto wallet to your Dasset account for easier access to things like staking, deposits, withdrawals, uh, authenticating your, um, your uh, logging into your Dasset account, and uh, m merging these things with AI, putting it all together and creating a metaverse experience. So uh, we're, we're starting to see some of this come together, but again, there's a long way to go. And of course, things pop up, you know, this whole AI uh, frenzy that's happened over the last few months that uh, was expected, but at the same time, unexpected. Uh, AI has been a hot topic uh, over the last decade, but it's it's really come full force with other products. And you know we're definitely looking at utilizing those tools uh, and making them accessible to customers. So uh, let's open it up to questions. Perhaps for some of that audience, you could uh, explain what a Bitcoin halving is in a bit more detail. Yeah, so Bitcoin halving yeah. is a is the mechanism in which the uh, supply of Bitcoin is released to the world. And it started in uh, 2009 with the first Bitcoin in, uh, I think, 9 January 2009. And every 10 minutes, you could mine 50 Bitcoins and you could use a laptop to mine those Bitcoins. And this, so uh, if I had a laptop, I started mining Bitcoin. I could mine 10,000 Bitcoin in 2009 and, uh, in a few days or a few weeks. And so there were a lot of people who 
we're able to, to do that. And as more people added computers to a network, it became harder and harder to mine those Bitcoin and required more and more computing power. But the mechanism so that there was a, an infinite amount of Bitcoin created is that every four years, the number of newly minted Bitcoin would drop by 50%. So in uh, so first four years, 50 Bitcoin was new, 50 new Bitcoin was issued every 10 minutes. Four years later in 2013, uh, uh, 25 Bitcoin was issued every 10 minutes. And that was halved to 12 and a half. Now it's 6.25. And so that has an impact on the inflation rate of Bitcoin, where because newly minted Bitcoin is being issued, there is an inflation rate. The, you know, inflation is an increase in the money supply. And so if you do believe that Bitcoin has that potential to be uh, that form of money, uh, a new form of money, uh, a better uh, technology for money, then we, we can't have an infinite amount. One of its values is it being scarce. And Satoshi Nakamoto modeled the issuance of Bitcoin after the, uh, the, the supply of gold. And so while the inflation rate was six, seven percent a few years ago, now I believe it's dropped under one percent, where 19 of the 21 million Bitcoin have been mined. So then we've seen a, a vast majority of the Bitcoin has been mined, and that continues to decline until the year 2140, where almost all the Bitcoin will be mined. Right now, a having is a supply shock. So if there's 6.25 newly minted Bitcoin being created every 10 minutes, that gets uh, sold onto the market because miners have to pay for electricity, they have to pay the bills. And so that is supply pressure uh, being put into the market and is put onto the market daily. And uh, I guess, I don't know what the mass is, but uh, 6.25 times uh, $24,000 per Bitcoin uh, times uh, uh, the number of Bitcoin mined in a day, it's uh, millions and millions of dollars. Well, when the supply is halved, that means there's less new Bitcoin entering the market, which creates a supply shock. And it takes uh, some months after the halving for that supply shock to be felt by the market. But that's usually what we've seen, where it takes a little bit of time for the market to absorb uh, those new Bitcoin. And when there's less of those Bitcoin, but demand starts increasing, then we're starting to see uh, that. Why does the increase in computing make mining slower? The amount of new Bitcoin is issued on average every 10 minutes. And so it's an average. So sometimes it uh, is a few minutes. Uh, sometimes it's um, 20, 40 minutes or more. But on average, over a long enough period of time, it's the it's it's about 10 minutes. And when more people add computational power to mine Bitcoin, the network adjusts the difficulty to uh, solve that problem. So it stays an average of 10 minutes. So as an example, and, and so uh, I guess going back, what, what happens is the Bitcoin network selects a magic number. And nobody knows what the magic number is but computers need to guess what it is. And so computers start guessing this magic number. And once one of them finds it, they put up their hand and they say, here's the magic number. And the, uh, the uh, network says, yep, that's the magic number. And the, the person, the computer that, that found it gets the reward of Bitcoin. So when and, and it takes about an average of 10 minutes to find this magic number. So if you think about it, where the number of computers or uh, computational power to find this magic number doubles, then the 
it's going to take uh, a lot more, uh, it's going to be a lot faster to find this magic number. And so what the network does is makes it more difficult to find that magic number. So it's always an average of 10 minutes. So the more computers that are power or computational resources used to find this magic number, that means that it's fat, it's, uh, that magic number can be found faster. So what the network does is makes the mass problems more difficult to, uh, so that it stays an average of 10 minutes. So the, so uh, then mining can get slower if a large amount of computers get taken off the network. So say that there's a certain amount of hash rate securing a Bitcoin network, and China puts a ban on mining Bitcoin. That takes out 30% of the computers securing the network. Well, if that's the case where it happens very quickly, then the, it will take a lot longer, it will be a lot slower because the computational power isn't there to, uh, to, to get uh, that magic number found every 10 minutes. And so what has to happen is the network has to readjust by making the lowering the difficulty because there's less computational power then the difficulty of finding the half or the magic number uh, becomes lower and so uh, it can be very disruptional for the network where it takes a very long time to process a transaction on the bitcoin network when a large amount of computational power is taken away and it requires an adjustment by the network, which happens every, uh, I think every 2000 blocks, every uh, certain number of uh, Bitcoin block confirmations, there is a, a network adjustment to the difficulty. Uh, hi, Jeremy, thank you for your question. Uh, what, call, uh, can you, what can you tell us about ordinals is what Jeremy would like to know. Thank you for joining us. I would say that uh, uh, so, so ordinals have interesting implications on, on all kinds of different markets, and it is something that we see in uh, in, in the Bitcoin market uh, when we look at how prices move. And so, I would say that there uh, is is an impact in both the uh, in, in the way that, that the Bitcoin price moves and it follows uh, follows them pretty um, pretty closely. Uh, I would say that you'd have to look at or talk to somebody who's more of a technical analyst uh, who studies that to give you, I think, more of an in-depth answer. But in terms of uh, price action, uh, Bitcoin would would do quite well. Uh, when you use ordinals. Now, uh, what, our next question. What is the Lightning Network and how can an end user use it? Great question. Ah, great question. So, uh, Lightning Network is a, what's called a layer two. So, what that means is it uses the Bitcoin network, but it is a, it's its own network that enables transactions to move at a much lower uh, fee and a lot faster. And how it works is uh, it requires a user to, so, so there are different users. Uh, just like the Bitcoin network, you have users like uh, node operators, miners, uh, end users, uh, like you and me, exchanges. They all have different roles within the network. In the Lightning network, it's the same way where they're different uh, users and they have different roles. And so there are wallet specific or the specific wallets for Lightning Network. And they have the software that uh, connects to the Lightning Network nodes. And so then you have the node operators where some of them are wallet providers, enthusiast exchanges, and uh, entities like Dasset. Uh, where we have a Lightning Network node. And essentially, a, a Lightning Network node is a computer that has staked 
Bitcoin onto the Lightning Network and connects to other uh, stake nodes. And you essentially have to create what's called a channel. And this channel is a connection between your Lightning wallet or what Lightning node and another uh, Lightning node on the Lightning Network. And what how it works is there is a, uh, you have a balance for Bitcoin and they have a balance for Bitcoin and both those nodes have staked a certain amount of Bitcoin. So uh, I've staked one Bitcoin and you've staked one Bitcoin. And because we're now part of this network, when somebody transfers half a Bitcoin uh, and it goes through our nodes, then um, uh I get debited half a Bitcoin and the other node gets credited half a Bitcoin. And so um, the settlement doesn't happen on the layer one, on the Bitcoin network. The settlement will happen at a later date when those node operators will close down their channels. And so what, what it enables is that the users that are staking Bitcoin um, can facilitate these transactions at a much lower cost because they're not having to record those Bitcoin transactions on the primary Bitcoin blockchain. That happens at an aggregate at, uh, at a later date. And so uh, that can facilitate lots of these small transactions where the transaction sending from point A to point B will cost uh, a hundredth of a cent or less, you know, we're, we're talking about Satoshis in terms of the cost and this facility. So this allows me to send uh, 10 cents to somebody else on the lightning network, which I couldn't do on the Bitcoin network. So I am sending Bitcoin. I'm sending it on this, what's called a layer two, which is on top of the Bitcoin network. And the promise is uh, lower fees, faster settlement and uh, uh, it's it's um, a lot easier for things like retail adoption and mass adoption. And so there's a couple of wallets, I believe the one that's really popular and, and what's being pushed in, uh, in, in El Salvador, it's called Stark, it's called Stark, uh, Strike, sorry, uh, it's called Strike. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's the, the name of the wallet. And so that's uh, one uh, Lightning Network wallet, but there are a few out there. And what it does is connects you to that network so that you can easily uh, send Bitcoin via the Lightning Network. And so you do have, when, if you do have Bitcoin, you do have Bitcoin in a wallet, you do need to convert that Bitcoin into Bitcoin on the Lightning Network. And most of these apps will facilitate that for you. But there, there are different ways of doing it. And it has been complicated in the past and it's getting easier and easier. Uh, so Don would like to know, he's been listening, but please could you summarize your outlook for Bitcoin, including variables such as the demise of shit coins? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is on the premise that you think Bitcoin has merit in the future that Bitcoin has some potential as a form of money or a medium of exchange or both. And that is something that I believe that it has the potential of being a better form of money in the future. Most people don't believe that or don't understand that. And that's okay. Uh, some people think, oh, well, the technology behind Bitcoin is promising, but Bitcoin itself is a dinosaur won't be in the future. And so based on that thesis, I think Bitcoin will do very well in the future and will continue its long-term adoption cycle. But my thesis is that today we are not returning to a bull market anytime soon. And uh, a lot of people are asking, are we in a bull market? Has bull market returned? And usually that is a signal in itself that we are likely not in a bull market. And uh, my thesis is that we're currently in a bear market rally, uh, but 
you know, this isn't set in stone, could be wrong. Uh, you, you know, I, I, I'm not promising or guaranteeing anything. Uh, things could change at a moment's notice. But I do believe, based on looking at the data and the outlook, that it's very likely we will have a retest of the lows of Bitcoin that we had at the end of last year at some point. And right now we're getting to a point where everyone's getting uh, very bullish and overhyped again. And so part of my thesis behind this is we haven't really seen a lot of these altcoins that really have no merit, no value uh, from 2021, 2022. They still have a lot of liquidity in them, but they are uh, still around and they're thriving in some ways. And what I think we're preparing for, and this is where uh, Bitcoin dominance, so I, I don't um, thought I had a graph for Bitcoin dominance, but Bitcoin dominance has been slowly increasing with the, this price increase uh, since the beginning of January. And I think this is where we're getting ready for Bitcoin to retake its throne, if you will, when it comes to you know, altcoins. People realizing that a lot of it is just junk and that uh, there are very few options out there. And a couple of them, like Bitcoin, are, um, uh, are you know are, are the the ones to keep and, and stick around. Uh, from there, of course, you have the platform tokens, which are competing with each other, and then the apps. And some of the apps hold merit. Uh, a lot of them do. A lot of those apps are producing revenue and are uh, great in terms of their value proposition. Uh, but as a percentage, they're very few. So if we, uh, tens of thousands of digital tokens out there, there might be a uh, hundred that are amazing apps or producing revenue that uh, have uh, that potential for continuation. Whereas a lot of them are knockoffs or are really just nothing. And so, um, they and a lot of them are still around and so we kind of need them to uh, go away so we can have uh, new innovation um, new tokens arrive that have uh, new ways of, of using them al would like to know do you have any thoughts in regards to the sec's recent admission of polka dot being considered not to be a security but rather morphed to a software are we about to see a wave of further classifications for the likes of Ethereum, et cetera? Mm, yeah, so great question. And this is something that is, is definitely something to keep an eye on, and that is regulatory risk. We've started to see a crackdown on crypto on the crypto industry by the banks, and this is happening around the world. We're not really sure where it's coming from, although we, there is hint that it's coming from US regulators. And that seems to be coming in different forms. And so uh, the SEC is certainly not done yet. And we're starting, we're seeing dissent within the SEC, which is great. There are people in the SEC that are disagreeing with kind of the mainstream view that's, that's happening right now, where everything that's not Bitcoin is a security. And that's Kind of what we want to see, but uh, I think the SEC is trying to work it out themselves, trying to work out what their role is. And there's potential for some good things coming out of the SEC. Uh, I think this XRP lawsuit, uh, as much as people might like or dislike XRP, they have had this long term lawsuit with uh, the SEC, and that will have a, a major enlightenment, I think, in terms of what the next steps are for the SEC. And in regards to specifically DOT, I mean, there are a lot of considerations, a lot of issues. And the, the ones that I've seen are the way that a token is founded and raises funds, which may 
seem like a security when in fact, if you look at it today, it doesn't really have the elements of a security. And a good case could be made that the way that Ethereum was launched and got off the ground made it a security at that time. But is Ethereum a security today? Uh, well, I'm not going to hypothesize on that. That's that's up to the SEC to decide. But it, it could very well uh, or very unlikely be considered an SEC or uh, a security. But the the transition from proof of work to proof of stake does, I think, cause some risk for some of these assets where the token may not be considered a security until it is staked and generating revenue. But as, as you pointed out, Al, the, uh, the, the thought that the dot is not a security is, is pretty good. Uh, I mean, that's kind of what we want to see. If they consider dot a security, it's really not good for Ethereum, uh, Cardano, and, and all these others. But uh, the, that is, I'd say, a healthy, healthy move. Um, looking at how crypto exchanges, you know, and staking is a security. I don't know. I think they're definitely uh, going the wrong path there. But, you know, you have two steps forward, one step back. And there is, that is kind of a spanner in the, in the works where uh, who knows which direction these regulators can go in. And you don't really want to rely on one regulator, one country to really dictate how the rest of the markets, in what direction it's going to go in. But it is a risk. And we've seen in different countries when, China created new rules in 2017 around crypto. Uh, Bitcoin price dropped 20%. And uh, when Bitcoin was banned in some country, it dropped 10%. And uh, when you know something happened in another country, the, the price... But we're starting to see a lot less of that impact uh, in, in the markets nowadays when, when regulators open their mouths, with the exception of the, the central banks. <laughs> but really... Uh, the, there, there is some regulatory uncertainty. ETFs are still a huge challenge in, with, in the U.S., although we're starting to see them elsewhere. I don't really think they're going to have an impact, major impact on adoption. But something to keep an eye on, particularly around DeFi and staking. Uh, staking DeFi tokens, considered securities, if you're staking it yourself, uh, how could they regulate it as a security. I mean, there's, there's a lot of implications, and I think they're kind of stuck between hard place and a rock uh, by saying that something is a security when you have complete autonomy over an asset and can stake it yourself. Then, you know, does that mean you have to get licensed? No, uh, but we'll see. I will mention Great. that uh, next month we have... Uh, uh, an amazing guest back, Matthew Shellcrest from um, Baker's Tilly. He'll be talking about tax and various other things and his view on um, the future of cryptocurrency. So please join us for that. That's on March 26th. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful rest of the day.